This is from Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 13. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I'm going to ask questions on that later on uh, afterwards and see, if, see who remembers what was read. This is from Psalm 8. Psalm 8, and the reading is uh, 6, 614, six, page 614 in the Old, Old Testament. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them, that you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under, the, under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we will continue now from a reading of the gospel. Today's reading is Matthew chapter 25, verses... 30 through 31, I have to check that. Verses 24 through 30? 31 through 40, thank you. 31 through 40. The word of the Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, 
You that are blessed by my Father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it unto me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Happy New Year. I am so glad to be here, and I feel so honored that court would... There we go. A little bit better. Is that good? There we go. I'll try that again. Happy New Year. There we go. Uh, I am incredibly honored that court would ask me to come and be with you and share my passion with you today. And um, I had to laugh when I came into your sanctuary and saw sheep because I was a shepherd true. I used to live in northern Vermont and I had a sheep farm. And so there is something very familiar about hay being strewn pretty much everywhere and about a sheep sitting there kind of smiling at me. And I, I love all of your windows. They are so incredibly beautiful and I feel so incredibly lucky to be able to join with you today. Now as some of you may know or might have read on the back of the bulletin, um, I, sh I studied with Court at Andover Newton Theological School, and I think we took over half of our classes together. So I know Court pretty darn well. My call and my training, though, is as a interfaith chaplain rather than a minister in a congregation, as Court has been trained. I graduated in 2015 and have been working for the past year and a half to finish my residencies as a chaplain intern. I was at the University of Vermont Medical Center last year and this past summer I finished up at the New England Baptist Hospital. Before that I was at Boston Medical Center, Newton Wellesley Hospital, and I even did a gig on chaplains uh, on the way with court ministering to the homeless. So our paths have overlapped each other several times. And just, is, just as there is a lengthy process for one to be ordained as a parish minister, there is also a very lengthy process for board certification as a chaplain. So I have now logged over 1,800 hours in service as a chaplain, and I have been most anxious to put to work my training. I was recently hired at the Boston Center for Addiction Medicine as the spiritual advisor. The center is in the process of clearing its final federal inspections and when completed and fully open, the Boston Center will offer, offer comprehensive treatment to those who suffer from alcoholism and addiction in the form of detox, inpatient treatment, extensive outpatient treatment, and will have a special unit for women who are detoxing through pregnancy uh, as well. So I'm most excited to be assigned as the spiritual advisor. So I will be able to provide spiritual and pastoral care to those patients and those families to give support and guidance to the staff, making sure that all patients and family, they have their spiritual needs met according to their faith. And that to build the spiritual care program not only within the center, but outside with communities of faith and secular communities, so that we can provide the Boston area with the finest addiction treatment facility here in New England. And so I will be pretty darn busy 
doing this job. And so today, technically, is my last free Sunday. <laughs> and what a year it has been, right? So it's New Year's, and 2016, my New Year's resolution for last year was to get a job. And I did it. I did it. And like many of you, the new year has come, and it's 2017. And this may be a very memorable new year for you. It may be just a regular new year for you. I have made many New Year's resolutions over the years. And there have been many that I have broken as well. And I do not think I am alone. According to the Journal of American Psychiatry, 48% of us make resolutions. So I'm in good company. 38% don't want to make resolutions. So there are those who are making a resolution not to make a resolution. There's a good number of those. And out of those who reported about making resolutions, there are four main categories that people make resolutions in. Self-improvement, weight, related solutions, money-related goals, and relationship goals. So last year, uh, I had at least two of those. One of them I got, I got a job, finished my training and got a job. The weight one I keep working on, that just keeps going every year onto the next list. And eventually, I'll get to a place where I'm comfortable with it, but though that's how I do it, is I keep putting my goals back on the next year's list. Resolutions that work are generally clear and focused on a specific goal, and most importantly, you just keep working at it. Now, there were many times in this past year when I wondered why I was doing what I was doing, particularly at 2 o'clock in the morning when I was on call and there was an ice storm and I had to go into the hospital, and I wondered why did I get myself into this. And then I returned down to the Boston area, and I wondered why did I leave Vermont, because frankly, there were times where I think being a shepherd would have been a lot more fun. I miss my farm, and I miss having sheep. And somehow the idea of living down here and doing chaplaincy work on one hand, but being up in northern Vermont, being, on, being a shepherd again, seemed really, really good, and I questioned why I made this goal to begin with. But I did because I felt that I was called, and blessings all around, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. So I have met my goal from last year. Now January has been the start of our new year since 45 CE, when Julius Caesar decided that he wanted to align the calendars the moon and the sun calendar, and bring his society kind of into line and start his year on January 1st. Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, is also a time of introspection, reflection, and redirection. And although it is celebrated in the fall, it is heralded in by watchers in the field who are looking for a sign of the new year. That sounds pretty familiar to our Christmas story of people watching by night to herald the good news. So there is some overlap. And certainly, Jesus practiced Rosh Hashanah, the new year, and he would have been aware of the new year of the Roman Empire. And as Jesus' message was carried and the Christian faith expanded, about 500 years after his death, in 532 CE, this gentleman by the name of Dionysus decided that he would set the tables correctly. And he put Christmas Day exactly seven days before the new year. And that is how we have Christmas seven days before New Year. And the Catholic Church at the Council of Trent decided that this would be a good idea, and they set it in motion. And it worked for about a 1,000 years, this timetable that the Christians had. But about a 1,000 years into it, in 1585, they noticed 10 extra days had gotten caught in the calendar. And so Pope Gregory XIII decided to straighten it up again. And now we have our current calendar. 
It is a mix of our Christian tradition, bringing Christmas into the new year, and Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish new year, all brought together with the Roman tradition of the new year in January. And we are a collection of our traditions and our cultures. And around the world, these things have changed. The ancient Babylonians would return, borrow objects, and pay their debts at New Year's. Romans made promises to God of Janus or January. And in medieval times, the knights would redo their chivalry vows called the peacock vows at around Christmas time. Living in northern Vermont, we would go to first night in Burlington and listen to live music. We would stay up late until the kids got older, and then we decided they could stay up late, and we would go to bed early. <laughs> now perhaps you stayed up late, and you watched the ball drop in Sydney, and then in London, and then in Times Square. Or perhaps you celebrated New Year's Eve with friends and family at a gathering, or perhaps you went to an alcathon. Perhaps you dressed up and danced, or maybe you just put your pajamas on. Maybe you kissed somebody to wish them a happy new year at the stroke of midnight, or maybe you were like me and you went to bed early. Now some of you remember, I think, that there was this huge buzz in 1999 about the Y2K bug, the millennial bug, and here we were switching a millennial, and everybody was freaking out because of this new thing called the internet, and everything was gonna crash. We were going to hit the year 2000, and nobody had figured out what to do digitally about it. And there was this big hullabaloo that everything was going to cease, that our banks were going to stop going, that the internet was going to crash as if it was a satellite that was going to come out of the orbit like a star. We woke up the next day, and nothing had happened. And we kind of looked at each other and went, huh, that was a whole lot of stuff for nothing. And we went on with our day. Now, in Jesus' time, there was an awful lot of stuff going on. There was a foreign occupier in the land of Israel. You were required to go register in one place. You were required to have taxes. You were most likely required to celebrate the Roman New Year, and you had Rosh Hashanah, so you had to make sure you had your sheep or your goat, or if you were Mary, a couple of turtle doves, and bring them to the temple. Life was complicated. And much like today, there were really hip people going around saying, this is a messianic movement. We are going to have a Messiah who is going to come, and that Messiah is going to clean everything up. And in fact, in our Christian tradition, we just celebrated the birth of our Messiah, this person who will come and clean up the socio-political economic mess that was at Jesus' time. And so Jesus comes, and he teaches, and he preaches. And his disciples are listening to his word, and then they start asking, saying, but Lord, when is this going to happen? Kind of like the Y2K bug, things are going to change. Lord, when is this going to happen? When is the new kingdom going to be here on earth? When are we going to see this? And Jesus, trying to teach his disciples, first gives them the parable of the bridesmaids saying you have to be ready. Make sure your lamp is full of oil because you do not know. Ecclesiastes tells us that for everything there is a time under heaven, but we do not know God's time. So Jesus teaches through parables, and he says the bridesmaids are going to be ready. And they still ask him, but Lord, when is this happening? And the next parable is about the talents. Get your house in order, but don't hoard everything because you never know when God is coming. You never know. And so the third time brings us to our readings today, where Jesus is trying to explain to them what's going on. And so through our readings, I want you to hear God's word is still speaking to us through these generations and these cultures. God is still speaking to us through the readings of Matthew. And Jesus says, I was in prison. I was sick. 
I was alone. And they said, Lord, when were you all of these things? When were you all of these things? And he said, when you fed me, when you welcomed me as a stranger, when I was naked and you gave me clothes, when I was sick and you visited me, when you do these to the least of me, these who are the members of my family, you do it to me. So Jesus has been very, very clear. He says that when you act towards the stranger in the way that you would act towards me, your Lord, you are doing this for me. And so Jesus has what I think his five New Year's resolutions. Here they are. Feed the hungry. Welcome the stranger. Clothe the naked. Care for the sick. And visit those in prison. Now some of these are pretty straightforward. Feed the hungry. You do. You have a basket. You brought up food. Some of them are a little bit more complicated. Visit those in prison. So I would challenge you to define what prison is. Prison might be MCI, where you're locked up behind bars. But prison might also be isolation that you suffer as an addict or an alcoholic. Or isolation you might suffer if you are alone. And you don't have company or you can't drive and you depend on somebody to come out. For isolation in itself is a prison. Care for those that are sick. We have our breast care awareness. We have our walk for autism. But what is sickness? Is it just sickness of the body or is it sickness also of the soul? Care for those who are lost spiritually. Care for those who are sick, not only of body, but perhaps of mind and of soul. Clothe the naked. We are a country with vast resources, and many of us look in our closet and we have those things that we don't necessarily use. I would encourage you to go to your closet, and if you have not worn it for a year, take it out and find a new home for it. Clothe the naked. And I think the most important one is welcome the stranger. And what does that mean? Is the stranger somebody that you don't know on the street? Or is it somebody that's perhaps here in church, three pews behind you that you just don't know? You've seen them many times here, but you really don't know who they are. So welcome the stranger, not just here in church or at coffee hour, but if you see them at the post office, if you see them at the supermarket, if you see them at the ball game. Also welcome those that you do not know, those who are strangers, with a smile when you walk. Smile and say hello to them with your eyes when you pass them on the street and bring them some joy for the day. Now the problem with this reading, this is lovely, but it kind of goes a little bit against Ecclesiastes, which says, wait a minute, God wants us to eat, drink, and be happy. It doesn't matter. God has a plan for us. We're just going to go do our thing. And Ecclesiastes is so beautiful. It's some of the most beautiful poetry in the Bible, there is something in every season, a time, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up, and we hear that part. And the part that I like the most is actually the end of that. For I know there is nothing better for them to live and be happy and enjoy themselves. Moreover, it is God's gift that all all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. Not just us, not just those that are here in the church, but all of God's creation. For the Psalm 8 and Ecclesiastes tell us that all mortals are born under God. Therefore, all of the kindness that Jesus has asked us to do in Matthew is for all men and women. And so it is with that, I look at my own New Year's resolution and I think, hmm, how am I going to do that? It sounds like he's describing in the sheep and the goats that we are to be like sheep, that perhaps, much like Jerusalem in his time, there are many goats out there and that there is going to be a separation. And so therefore, in my resolution, I want to make sure that I do my part 
in God's work. No matter what my talents and treasures are, I want to do my part. And therefore, I want to be a sheep. I want to come out this year as a sheep. I want to do my best efforts to feed the hungry, to welcome the stranger, to clothe the naked, to care for the sick, and to visit those in prison. For if we do this for any member of the family of God, we do it for, we do it for Jesus Christ. Amen.